Hi guys, welcome. This is a short four session course on scientific writing. Um, before we think about the structure of the course, let's just think a little bit about maybe what your first feel about this course is. Um, because you might be tempted to think this is just a course requirement. Just have to, have to do it. It's not really about being a scientist. Well, I'm afraid I've got good news and bad news for you. The good news is it's most likely that most of you have the makings of reasonable scientists or chemists. And probably in time you'll be able to plan your research conduct and execute that research and it will be solid research well thought out strong research questions with results that you can use that will be good for you and good for chemistry excellent good news always feels good the bad news is that no matter how good you are even if you're the next Einstein your career will be blighted. It will fail if you cannot communicate effectively in verbal and written form. That's why this course is compulsory. And that's why you're doing it at the beginning of your master's program or your PhD program. OK, that sounds that sounds fairly heavy. Let's now think a little bit about what we're going to be doing. So in tonight's session, we'll think a bit about the setup for the next four weeks. And throughout all of the sessions, we'll be thinking about the verbs. We'll talk about that more in a moment. We'll think about how communication underpins basically our whole careers and how writing is a root communication skill. Beyond that, writing for a reader, how to start, types of writing, we will actually handle these a little bit this week, some next week, some the week after. So they're going to be peppered through along with the other stuff that, that you need. OK, for tonight's session, I'm hoping you've read Unit 2.2, Effective Writing of the Course, um, I was going to say the course book, the course ebook. It's a www.nature.com citable. It's uh, an ebook which is all about writing science. And actually, guys, it's pretty damn good. So I recommend you read it. There are also other things that I pillage on the way through and I'll reference them as I do so. OK, so let's think about writing. Some people think that writing has three distinct stages, pre-writing, writing, rewriting. Re well, I agree that it's a circuitous process. And I think it has distinct stages. But I'd really define them as pre-writing, writing, rewriting, writing, rewriting, rewriting, writing, rewriting, dot, dot, dot. And in fact, one of the most useful types of person that I need in my writing is somebody who can tell me when to stop writing and do the next thing. And if you have that problem, that's a good problem. OK, so let's move on. So the text, the recommended text we've talked about. Some of you may prefer to have, there's the recommended text. Some of you may prefer to have something on your desktop, which is more than a, uh, an ebook. I can only share with you the books I have, and I'm not recommending, not saying go out and buy these. 
quite the contrary. Maybe I would have, wouldn't I? The Oxford Manual of Style. Essential grammar, essential, essential stylistic stuff that I've used right through my life. I'd recommend that. For me, it's great. For you, it might not be. If you're a physical or analytical chemist, I'd recommend this little book. Um, it was actually published originally by the Royal Institute of Chemistry. This is a very, very old copy. But actually, the Royal Institute of Chemistry and the Chemical Society joined forces whew, maybe 20 years ago to form the Royal Society of Chemistry. However, the Royal Society still publishes this book. This is a book of effectively style for quantitative um, units, equations, the sort of uh, the, the, the business of, of quantitative writing. And for me, that book's also essential. Anyway, so we're starting our journey together. And for each of you, the journey will be different. For all of you, at some points, it will be relatively easy. And for all of you, at some points, it will be a total, rude word, nightmare. The architecture of this course is designed around groups. So, if you work together in your groups and are patient, I think you'll be glad you did the journey. And certainly your career will be glad. OK, guys, let's look at the structure of the next few weeks and think about assessment and such things. So this is from the module web page. And you can see you've got a component on literature survey, a component on scientific writing, which is this component, a component on scientific presentations. You have and, and that's, if you like, 90 minutes in each of the evenings you have. The other 90 minutes, you have assignments, self-directed learning, and discipline-specific discussion groups. And these discipline-specific discussion groups are where you do your presentations. Organic, material, physical, analytical energy and environment, food science and environment technology. And if you're analytical energy and environment, the bad news is that's my group and uh, you'll be with me for uh, both parts of uh, the next few weeks. So the scientific writing with me starts in week eight, which is tonight. Well, it will be when, when you hear this. And you, we have four weeks and it lasts till halfway through um, with me. We'll kill it at 20 past seven. The second part of the evening, you will be split into your groups. And those of you who are in analytical energy and environment will be with me. And that starts at 7.40. And that goes on till 9. OK, so that's the uh, big picture. We should talk a bit about assessment. Each of the three components of the module so this is the scientific writing part, the module has an assignment which is 20%. So 20% plus 20% plus 20%, that's 60% of the module in terms of the marks. The other 40% comes from your presentation. And talk about that in the presentation groups when we actually come to that. OK, how does each evening look? Well, we're now in week eight and we have we do seem to have two week 11s. We actually only have four evenings, eight, nine, 10, 11. And those evenings look like this. This is this evening up until this is now. You haven't had any lecture to look at before this lecture, I'm doing it now. But normally in 9, 10, 11, 
there'll be an e lecture for you to have looked at then from normally from six till seven you'll be doing a writing exercise tonight we're doing this instead and then from uh, 7 to 7.20, you'll be doing peer evaluation or peer assessment of that writing exercise. And I'll talk about that next week when we actually do it. For this week eight, you haven't had the e-lecture. You've got that now effectively. And you'll have a preview writing exercise from 7 to 7.20. And I'm going to ask you in your groups to do something with that afterwards. You'll be need to work in your groups for this stuff both in and out of the session your groups are to maintain your sanity they're for mutual support and discussion and assistance and i don't envisage plagiarism issues um, because none of you are foolish enough i hope to start a verbatim copying from each other okay so what is this telling you it's telling you the modus operandi for this writing part is flipped you prepare for each session in the session you do the writings you do the writing before we proceed in the live version of this lecture are there any questions on organization if you're watching this as an e-lecture and you've got questions on this sort of stuff please email me immediately okay let's move on this is the content of the scientific writing part of the course. And what I've done is mostly highlighted the verbs. Understanding the purpose of scientific communications and knowing the target audience. How to select and organize content so that you can target a broad audience or a specialised audience. How to explain motivation hypothesis. Motivation hypothesis, why you're writing something and what, uh, what the framework of your thinking is, is pretty much 101 for writing papers and proposals and just about everything else. So we'll spend a bit of time on that. How to communicate the outcomes. Probably uh, not next week, but the week after. Explaining the conventional structure. Introduction, materials, methods, results, discussion and conclusion. And how to write an abstract of the work. We'll come back to this. And each week we, we will come to this. The reason that you'll see this each week and why I'm doing it this way is actually you're going to be doing writing practice in the sessions and peer assessment. So these verbs become really rather important. OK, this is slightly a lesson in the bleeding obvious. Um, your science careers, you could split into four domains. I've stolen this diagram from the Careers Research and Advisory Center. Knowledge and intellectual abilities, that is doing research. Personal effectiveness, things that make your approach as an effective researcher. Organisation, the requirements to do research, professionalism. And engagement, influence and impact. All of these A, B and C lead to D. There is no point in being a scientist if D doesn't happen. Writing the results of your scholarship and your work are the route to making an impact, uh, in influencing others, and hence why it's here. I won't go through this. Writing proposals for funding, papers for submission, writing and arguing with referees, and actually, guys, you need to argue with referees, um, publishing in good journals writing public articles, writing policy documents. All of this stuff is in this diagram. And in this course, we'll be thinking quite a lot more about those things. Communication is probably the one thing that underpins all of your career, whether it's in science or outside of it. That's why this module is all about communication. 
verbal presentations, posters, writing, literature, surveys, etc. Writing is key. OK, this is not an English language course, but there are probably some important things that you need to know, quite straightforward things, about making your writing easy to understand, to make your readers quicker to grasp your meaning. Um, your key mission in anything you write is to get your message across. And there are some basic grammatical rules that you need to know and you need to practice. OK, so first of all, we'll start at the small, not quite the smallest unit, one of the smallest units, sentences. Each sentence is a step in the journey that you're planning. Now, three golden rules. Put your actions in verbs. Put characters in subjects. Keep subjects near verbs. Now, you might say, what the hell is he talking about? Well, there's two types of writing. There's first person writing. So I took the sodium hydroxide and added it to. Or there's so-called passive voice writing or third part party writing, which is the sodium hydroxide was added to the whatever. Unfortunately, a lot of people have been taught that passive voice writing is somehow more scientific or more quantitative. I'm sorry, take that advice, put it in a bin bag and burn it. That is rubbish and we'll talk about why it's rubbish in a second. So a verb is a doing word, an action word. The first person verb, the, the verb, the way we want you to write, we analyze the data and you've got a verb analyzed. Many people turn the verb into a noun. We performed an analysis on the data. General advice, this nominalization means that you're going into passive voice or third party writing. The advice of all the good journals is don't do this or do it sparingly. By the way, I've also used quite extensively the Duke science writing course, and this is pillaged from that course. OK, so the first thing, put actions in verbs. General advice for sentences. And again, this general advice for sentences is again about putting action in verbs. Let's give you a couple of examples. The bacteria move themselves in the liquid medium with microflagella. It's great. We've got the character in the subjects. We've got the actions in the verbs. The movement in the liquid media of the bacteria was accomplished by microflagella. So this is more uh, third party or passive voice. Two things you should know about your human reader. We have a limited number of slots in our short term memories, which determine how much we understand. Depending on which author you believe, you've got four to seven slots in your short term memory. Information goes in there like movement, liquid medium. If you can't process that information in probably 25 seconds, you lose it, it evaporates. Like when you wake up and the dream is really clear, five minutes later you can't remember what the dream is about. So you're helping your reader if you put your actions in verbs, makes it easy to understand. And if you put characters in subjects and keep subjects near verbs. And here is one little example. Identify the main subject and its verb in your sentence. If they are far apart, rephrase the sentence to bring them closer together. You only have four to seven slots in your short term memory. So if you're reading something like this, peanut, shrimp, almonds, milk, blah, 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 Uncle Joe Cobbly represent things that people are commonly allergic to. There's an awful lot of things there to get in your short term memory before you actually get to work out what the sentence is about. People are commonly allergic to things like blur, 
very much clearer, much shorter, easier to process. The reader looks for two things. They look for who or what is the sentence about and what are they or what is it doing. You need to make it easier for your readers, not harder. So um, if you are putting actions in verbs, characters in subjects, and keep subjects near verbs, you're making it easier for your reader. Great. Now, that's the sort of sentence structure. Let's go to the next stage, which is sentences and beyond sentences. Our aim is to make our reader, or to help our reader understand our writing. Science is complicated enough without making the style a barrier. Most readers will find your writing more clear and understand it more easily and consistently if you begin sentences with familiar old information and conclude sentences with unfamiliar new information. So the next three things for sentences is beyond put new information last. We're not saying passive voice is illegal. Use it judiciously as little as you can. And make sure the first and last sentences of a paragraph match. So why put new information last? Well, if you begin a new sentence with new information, your reader gets a brand new spanking idea without any context whatsoever. He or, they, or he or she may try to link this with information from the previous sentence, probably incorrectly. And they've got to wait to read the rest of the sentence before they either realise that actually, oh my goodness, I've misunderstood this. So they've got to re revise their reading and revise their understanding to actually get to what your meaning is. Do this too much. Do it at all, but do it too much. Writing can, your writing becomes confusing as it lacks cohesion. Going backwards and forwards like this slows the reader down, so it takes more time for them to understand your reading. And of course, remember they only have a limited short term memory, so you make it harder for them. And the person you're hurting here actually is you. So here's an example here is a paragraph. And blue is, sorry, try again, blue is old information, red is new information. So it starts off, farmers try to provide optimal growth growing, con growing conditions for crops. As we know this, this is what farmers do. They, they grow things, that's excellent. By using soil additives to adjust soil pH. So here's the old information, and you've helped your reader, you've helped your reader, actually by using the new information last. Now, this gets more difficult. The second sentence, and I've broken this up in sentences, garden lime or agricultural limestone, this is new information, what the hell is that, it's new, is made from pulverized chalk, fine, and can be used to raise the pH of the soil. So here, you started with new information and you've ended with old information. This would be better put because you've introduced pH here, so it's old information. To raise the pH of the soil, garden lime or agricultural limestone is used, which is made from pulverized soil, blah, blah, blah. So you need to reverse the order of this sentence. And again, in the third sentence, clay soil. Where, where's this? We've not talked about clay soil anywhere. No idea. That's new information. Shouldn't be there. Agricultural lime is old information. You mentioned it there. So agricultural lime can be added to clay soils which are naturally acidic to improve the pH or whatever, how you're going to phrase it. So blue first. Red second. Your reader 
is going to understand that more easily. And more important, actually, by giving the new information at the end of the sentence, putting something at the end of the sentence gives it emphasis. So there you go. OK, we talked a bit about passive voice. Nature says that to its authors. Science says that to its authors. So active, the dog chased the ball. Passive, the ball was chased by the dog. Note, you've increased the distance of the sentence for the reader to understand it. Passive, even worse, the ball was chased. So, um, good advice. And they're the journals you're going to publish in. So, very good advice. Okay, we're getting close to the end now. If a sentence is a step, a paragraph is a thought. Look at this sentence. Each sentence, so it's a paragraph. Each sentence, my favourite animal is a domestic cat. Fine. Cats were domesticated almost 10,000 years ago, so you've got continuity in ancient Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia, where is this paragraph going? Your sentences are cohesive. So actually, you know, you, you've got a step, a step, a step. But the paragraph is incoherent. For the paragraph to be co coherent, the first and last sentences of the paragraph must match. You're aiming for cohesion and coherence. This just causes your reader a headache and to get angry. Here's a different paragraph about dimethyl sulfide, which is uh, emitted by the, atmosphere, by the oceans into the atmosphere. Recent studies show that DMS, that's what we're about, and we've got a sentence there. The sea air exchange process remains one of the most important pathways in the natural cycle, and there has been speculation that DMS emissions may ultimately regulate climate. End of the paragraph. This, the first sentence and the last sentence, match. So it's coherent. Okay. If a paragraph is a thought, then the first and last sentences of that paragraph must match. OK, we're still not an English course, but some general things. You want good words. You don't want words that do nothing. You don't want needless words. You prefer simple words. You're going to use simple subjects. And you're going to use adjectives and adverbs frugally. So, OK, ineffectual phrases, phrases that add nothing and just take up the word count. Note that it should be noted that respectively it isn't. Find these phrases in your writing and leave them out and shoot them. They're not useful and they're a problem for good, concise writing. Wordy phrases, again, that add nothing. Here's a list of wordy phrases on the left and another list here. Find them in your writing, root them out. If you've got that phrase, consider just that word. You can save 20 or 30 percent of your words this way to produce a more concise document. Um, I, I routinely read a large number when they could have written many, or due to the fact that instead of because. Um, it's ridiculous. Don't make this mistake in your own writing. Um, bad writers like long words because they look more impressive than short ones. And worse, they think they're using longer words when in fact uh, they're using different words. So most times people use methodology. They mean method, a way of doing something. Usage. Um, instead of use. 
find out what these words mean because what you what you you must mean what you write mean what you write and write what you mean and if you don't know the meaning of the words you're using you can't know what it means science is hard enough and complex enough without making it more complex by the style this monster sentence scientists try to cram too much in accomplish too much in a single sentence huge distance between verbs and subject nightmare this sentence has been split into two and is clearer you can see what they're trying to do and these are examples for you to emulate simplicity adjectives and adverbs i've given you some examples here think of the impact of the symptom has on your reader very extremely everything is very or extremely or very important or whatever it's usually not it's just um, important or it's innovative it's not very innovative or extremely innovative usually these are excess words and you annoy your reader you don't want to do that completely and utterly alone repetition you just mean alone you're not trying to make your reader cry it's science state the facts okay bit of hedging is okay one hedge is fine if you've got multiple hedging these results may suggest that our method may possibly identify a putative enhancer then your readers already thinking hmm uh, not sure I believe this not something you want demeaning verbs obviously clearly might not be clear to your reader you're just making your reader feel like an idiot not what you want to do if that reader's your referee and self-aggrandizement oh, our work is exciting groundbreaking your readers probably going to be in your area how does that make them feel it's a problem if you need their view on something like uh, reference on your paper okay the English lesson is finished your reader is both your guest and your judge you are taking your reader on a journey that you have planned not some walk down a muddy bog where you can't know the way out at the end and you're lost a journey that you've planned by a route you've chosen to a destination you've decided you hold all the cards you're in a strong position so to make sure that you capitalize on that make sure you know your reader we'll talk more about this in a moment the tools you have for your journey are structure 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 we'll talk about it later argument logic and style and some of that style clear concise terse supported and authoritative we've talked about this morning not today already so we're coming to the end of this introduction how to start it's always the same writing is always a problem you need two things you do not need perfection you need to know what the purpose of your scientific communication is why do you want to write it and who will be your reader or your audience you don't know you need to know anything else with those two things you can start writing doesn't matter if it's half formed no structure imprecise just get those thoughts down on paper or into your laptop as you write you'll begin to process your own thinking and also I'm going to suggest as a scientist growing you need to read and write at least half an hour a day each so an hour a day reading and writing as you then write and rewrite and rewrite you've got more information your own thinking develops so what you are writing develops 
Of course, try and form loose structures. But to start with, just write. When you've got something hard to do, which you don't want to do, you clean the house, you do everything. It's called displacement. You don't have time in your life for displacement. Not in writing anyway. Start writing and keep writing. OK, the next three weeks, next week, purpose, audience, motivation, hypotheses, targeting and written style, saying what you mean and meaning what you say. Week 10, structure, 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 to deliver an outcome, writing scientific papers and proposals, and we'll deal here with the standard structure of a paper. And there'll be a bit more English lesson in there. Um, week 11, structure, structure, looks like I, I, I'm stuttering, same thing. In fact, I can't understate this, and we'll look at different aspects of structure for different types of documents. In life, you are not perfect. Do not therefore aim for perfection, either in your writing or in your personal life. You will always disappoint and be disappointed. Effective, you can go for and you can achieve. And what we're talking about here now in the next two or three weeks is to be an effective writer. Okay. So, you've written an abstract for your presentation. This is your first writing practice. Writing practice zero is a prequel for the next two weeks. Meet your reader. She's a 30-year-old Angmo assistant professor from Harvard. She's a chemist, but she's not in your area. You want to invite her to a session on your work, and you're going to send her an email. In less than 60 good words, summarise your motivation the purpose of your research and your research questions or the research questions you think you can address to convince her to come to a talk you're giving. Your email must be easy to digest and if you want a verbal analogy it's like meeting somebody in a lift. That's how long you've got to persuade them to come to your talk. Don't wait for perfection but you do need a clear view of your purpose. Afterwards, in your group, look at each of the um, things that you've written for, for this reader. Was it the journey you planned? Did you choose the route? Did it get to the destination you decided? Look at each other's work, commonalities and differences. For next week, you need to read Unit 1, 2. In fact, the whole of Unit 1 is great, but 1, 2 is fine um, for the preparation for the session and for the e-lecture. Finally, any fool, man or woman, can answer questions. Judge a man or a woman, not by his answers or her answers to questions, but by their questions. That's why writing is so difficult, because you have to ask the questions. Anyway, OK, guys, nice to meet you. Good luck and uh, see you next week. Bye bye.